Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. And welcome, everyone, to The Wilder Ride, Getting Wilder by the Minute, a podcast where we break down and celebrate the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. We are looking at the film for our first season, Young Frankenstein, and I'm one of your hosts. I'm Alan Sanders. And I'm your other one of your hosts, Walt Murray. And joining us here today in the Castle von Frankenstein, as we are making our way down into the denizens of the castle, we've got a couple of PIs who know how to find people that don't want to be found. Returning as one of our guests, Matt Gray, welcome. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Great to have you back here, Matt. I'm, I'm, you must have enjoyed yourself the last time you were here. Well, that's a strong word, but I was there. <laughs> and I'd say, I'd say, I'm not the biggest guest here. Oh, you're not? No, I, I'd say there's someone a little above the rung on me. Well, we have also another P.I. We've got Ben Peacock. <laughs> and uh, Peacock is doesn't really define everything, uh, but that is my last name, so we'll go with that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not what it's I do. It's not German. It's not German for anything. <laughs> it's not German. For well, and, and Ben, I, I think I won that $20, because remember I said that within one minute, Matt will embarrass himself. Yeah, it didn't take that long. Oh, hold on a minute now. <laughs> I thought that was pretty smooth. <laughs> oh, no, it was. <laughs> It was super smooth. <laughs> I'm beginning to feel like I'm the victim in this scenario. Uh, of course you are. Well, we did have you sign that waiver for a reason. Yeah, that's true. I did sign that contract. Yeah. Well, when we start off, we were, if you remember where we were last Friday, when we last left off in minute 30, they had just identified a couple of switches on the wall, and they looked dangerous, so Igor uh, so told the doctor, you go first. So we start off with the flipping of a switch, and we will end with what? A filthy mess. And a whole lot of non-talking in between, except for a very distant voiceover. So let's get started. We're at the very beginning of this scene. Walt, we spent all last week slowly getting deeper and deeper into this, uh, into this, some of the areas of the castle that have been either hidden off or walled off, or you needed to find a secret way to get down there. We eventually pair up with Igor, who tells us that there's some switches on the wall as they make their way into one area. Take it from there. Where are we going now? Well, this is uh, this is another great Igor scene. He says, "Look, a couple of switches on the wall. It looks dangerous. You do it." So he, you know, again controlling that relationship and controlling the uh, the doctor there pushes him to go uh, turn the light switch on, and then of course he does, and huge explosion, huge electrical charge, and one of the great lines out of this movie. The internet is littered with this line, and it's it's amazing. He says, "Damn your eyes." And, of course, Igor points to his eyes and says, too late. Too late. <laughs> ben, when you first saw this, we, we we usually try to do this when we first bring in a new guest. Matt's been with us before. But do you remember first seeing Young Frankenstein before we keep diving into this minute? Yeah, of course. I was probably 10, 12 years old and probably caught it on one of your normal stations that were showing movies. Uh, probably wasn't supposed to watch it if my parents had known. <laughs> uh, but just remember just all the comedy. And, I, and Walt and I were talking earlier. Some of the stuff was uh, dated then. You know, you don't remember everything but still just hilarious and and i think the physical comedy is was just huge and this is a perfect example nobody fell downstairs or anything but just the way igor looked and uh yeah it's great great movie a lot of good memories and yeah grateful just to be a part uh, of today's show too this visual gag that you just described Walt. there's two switches the first switch is the one of course that has all of the sparks and the flurry mm-hmm. and almost gets him electrocuted and he throws the switch back down yells at igor But the second switch does, in fact, work. So sort of a gag that was actually written into the script. What wasn't written into the script was the damn your eyes and too late. That was a bit of an ad libber thrown in as they were rehearsing the scene. Well, and the the damn your eyes line is interesting because it's a very English line. And there's a lot of discussion on this out there. One of the things that I I found, I think that the guy is an English literature professor uh, or student possibly. And he said that this is kind of a general curse that the commoners would use towards an enemy to basically say, I hope you go blind. So it, it's kind of a, a an interesting throw in there by the doctor. Number one, you know, Doctor Frankenstein is American. Throws out a very English curse, 
but then also it is a um, uh, kind of a harsh word to use. So uh, kind of an interesting line to throw in, but perfectly played by Igor. You know, again, Marty Feldman making use of his messed up face and and pointing it out and saying too late. What it kind of plays back to earlier when they meet at the train station and he pats him on the hump. You know, and he, I don't remember what minute that was, but he's like, oh, my bad. He's like, what? What's the big deal? What? You know? What hump? And it has a thumping sound. And yeah. But it kind of plays to that a little bit, you know, that he's such a weird character. Also, in the last minute when we discovered him, we thought he was the freshly dead head. And he goes, I have a hunch. And he makes it makes a little ha like he points to his hump. Yeah. So he certainly has no fun making fun of himself and his ailments, but also that this the eye thing for Marty Feldman. That's a true ailment he had as an individual, and still said, you know what, go with it, make fun go of it. Go with it. Yep. I did not know that watching this film at first. I was like, wow, the visual effects team and the makeup artist must have won an Academy <laughs> Award because that looks amazing. And I looked it up and I was like, oh, that's real. That's yeah. Bad. The eyes or the hunchback. <laughs> well, no, the eyes. Yeah. The eyes. hunchback, I'm sure, could have been real as well. But no, the eyes. Uh, it's yeah, the eyes freaked me out. And he and he and he took and ran with it with the rest of his career. The yeah. short life that he did have, he was very successful in comedic roles because of that. Now, according to several sources, dovetailing on what you said, Walt. Earliest recorded use of the phrase, damn your eyes, is found in the 1759 novel, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman. The phrase is referred in there as the lowest oath of a scavenger, indicating both that it was already an insult and that it was in common use even prior to that. Now, Matt, you've read that, right? Oh, yeah. I, I did a thesis on this uh, for fun. <laughs> it's obviously a lie, folks. It's a, no, that's, a lie. some things speak for themselves. It's it's all good. <laughs> so, but apparently, uh, that so this is a phrase that's been around for a long time. I don't know that American audiences necessarily would have picked up on it, but it didn't matter because we see Marty Feldman go right to it. The camera zooms right in, comes right back out. Yeah, and and I think it's. It's enough of a good kind of punchline that the audience, would, even though they might not have gotten what that is from, they would get that it was kind of an insult towards him or a, a reaction to him making him turn the light switch on. And, and then, of course, you know, Feldman's response to it was perfectly played. We move along and the doctor then pulls up the second switch. And this time, lights come on and we get really a, a nice tracking shot it comes up from below shows our cast sort of looking over obviously a large area and then we have a very gentle sweep as the camera looks down almost from the same level of the balcony where our main actors are down across a very dusty and cobweb strewn laboratory well and it's it's funny two things here you know they're looking at the the lab for the first time and so they're first seeing, you know, here's where everything happened. For me, when I was watching it again this week, watching this minute, I was like, there's all the equipment from the 1931 Frankenstein. So it's almost like, you know, I'm having a discovery moment while they're having a discovery moment for two different things. Um, me for the historical aspect, but, you know, and then obviously for them for here's where Dr. Frankenstein did his work. Ben, your perspective. Did you know, or had enough background of the movie that all the gear we get a, a shot here of all this lab equipment was part of the original Boris Karloff Frankenstein? No, it's funny. Fra Frankenstein. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We actually <laughs> talked about this recently. So when I went back and watched the movie and the minutes, I'd done a little bit of research just on the movie itself and, and love Mel Brooks. And yeah, saw that. That's. I think that shows and talks to the intelligence of Mel Brooks, right? I mean, and, and it's... This stuff's even was still around when they they performed the movie or made the movie. That's um, yeah, it just speaks to his to his wisdom and it's great, it's awesome. Now I have not gone back. What I'd like to do is go back and look at the original and see if we can see the original lab and, and see how it laid out. If it was laid out similarly, actually, Walt had shown me screenshots the other day of the original. What was it? Nineteen thirty Frankenstein. Nineteen thirty one. Yeah, I got released. I got a whole new appreciation for watching this scene because after you showed me those screenshots, I was like, "Wow, they got it all the way down to like the camera angle as well. Everything was so it's all laid out the same. Everything it was is. spot That's on. Great. Yeah, I mean, like, awesome. the nineteen thirty one cast could have walked right into that lab. Yeah. I mean, it's really amazing the detail that they spent. And remembering that this is a comedy, and they went to that kind yeah. of detail to replicate that uh, really says a lot. Well, you know, you have people who are watching this who had seen the 31, you know, they're, they're contemporaries for that. And you know that they flashed back to those scenes. And yeah, it's great. It's awesome. Yeah. And I, I'm sure for, for the folks who had seen that 31, you know, because 
like our parents growing up in that time frame probably had seen it or, you know, seen it on TV or whatever. Well, it was a classic monster movie. It was always repeated on television. It was something you could almost find, especially around Halloween. It's still, to this day, most people recognize the Boris Karloff edition of Frankenstein, that monster, you know, the flathead, the screws in the neck. I mean, we just, I mean, that's the monster Frankenstein we all know growing up, just as like, that's the cultural ver- version of Frankenstein that we know. Yeah. And even with the other, the other Frankensteins that we've had so far, if you go out on Halloween and look at a kid in a Frankenstein costume, that's yeah, Frankenstein. The, yep. That's what they're wearing is yep. Boris Karloff. And, and I really do appreciate even more and more as we're going through this minute by minute, how much care and concern they gave to preserve that 1931 Frankenstein. You know, if you think of comedies today, it's all either slapstick or crude humor. It, it, this is a more intellectual kind of, of humor, but you really take a lot from it. I, I'd like Mad Life definitely like to see those photos and not not photos that you took of yourself. I mean, just photos. <laughs> well, I've already sent those to you, and you should have those and don't share them with anyone else. <laughs> Did you have to use the wide angle lens? Um, but no, just uh, it's a lot of care and touch to, to the movie for sure. One of the elements we talked about with one of our guests, I think it was Sean last week. They this movie, if you took the humor out still could look like a horror movie, like a throwback horror movie. The elements, the lighting, the shading, everything would be like, I'm watching a 30s-style monster picture. And I think that's what helps keep this work for years and years and years after its release. Here we are, 44 years after it was, well, almost, it'll be 44 years this December. We're still looking at and enjoying this movie. Yeah, and you still have, you know, the jump scares and the the tension that builds, the music, and it, it is. It's still a monster movie. Yeah, at its heart, it is definitely a monster movie. And as we get deeper, we'll see when the when the creature shows up, there are some elements that they could go one way or the other, depending how the filmmakers went with the story. And they often aired on the, not aired, but often went the side of comedy. But sometimes they even to trick us. We don't know which way they're going to necessarily go. There's an interesting element here with this slow camera move over the lab. We hear a distant echo of a recreated voice of what we can only assume is Victor Frankenstein and his assistant. Well, you've got an interesting little factoid about this. Yeah, and this took a little bit of work on my part, which I don't always enjoy, but I was trying to figure out who did the voice. And initially, I kind of thought they had gone back and taken the soundtrack from the 1931 and dropped it in here. And so that's what I was trying to find out. It turns out that Mel Brooks is actually doing the voice of Dr. Frankenstein. And going back and listening to that two or three times, I couldn't pick that out. It, it, it didn't. It sounds enough like him that I, I believe that. But IMDb even credits him as the voice of, of Victor Frankenstein. He plays a role in so many of his movies. You, know, you would have thought he'd have played some part, but it being a voiceover never would have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the... One of the caveats Gene Wilder had is he did not want Mel Brooks to be a character actor in this. He normally does play a silly part or a goof. And he said, I, I don't want that. This We need to do it a, a serious, a serious comedy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and Mel Brooks agreed sort of begrudgingly. He's actually in the movie three times. This is the second time. The first time was the werewolf howl. He with the werewolf, yep. werewolf. He was the werewolf howl. This is the second time. We'll have one more Mel Brooks insertion coming up later in this movie. And I'm going to be surprised because I can't remember what the third one is. Oh, I know. I know I'll remember it in a minute. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, and I wonder, because it's not in the script as well, this is a moment where the cameraman, the cinematographer specifically recreates a very slow, lets the audience walk through almost visually this entire lab area. So there's a lot of footage with nothing being said. And I wonder if Mel Brooks thought, I need a little something. And if I can, because the place is all covered in cobwebs, it's covered in dust, it's obviously not been used in decades. To have that faraway echo, almost as if the voice of Victor Frankenstein still exists in this room to this day, I think was a pretty cool touch. I think so too. And then you do get kind of a a Mel Brooks, Gene Wilder bounce off of that. Because they get through panning through the room. You have that serious moment. You've got Victor Frankenstein and, and Igor. And then the response to it is, what a filthy mess. <laughs> and, and so it's almost like, oh, yeah, this is a comedy. Don't forget, this is a comedy. Well, what's interesting, before before this big, long pan and ending with that line, what a filthy mess, we do hear almost in a sense of awe. Because remember, he's been running from the Frankenstein name. Mm-hmm. 
but almost the sense of awe when he says, so this is where it all happened. He's recognizing at least part of this tale, however wild or crazy or stupid or demented or or doo doo, as he said yes. in the in the uh, lecture, he at least recognizes. So this part so far is real. Every every time he gets closer, he's finding more real, more reality to come to grips with. You know, there's something interesting about this. As I've listened to some of the other shows, you watch the movie differently, right? It's one minute. There's there's so much in that minute. When the lights first come on, I, I noticed this the other day. Terry Gar gently grabs Wilder's elbow. And I don't know, that was kind of interesting to me, you know, knowing how the movie plays out. It's subtle, but a little bit of fear, I'm sure, you know, everything that's going on in the situation. And it, again, it's small, but she grabs his elbow kind of as a security kind of thing, which I, I thought was pretty interesting as well. Well, Matt, let me ask you this, because we established that it seems like there's right now anyway, sort of a mentor relationship that Gene Wilder has taken on. Do you, when you find yourself lost at work, do you grab Ben's elbow and have him take um, you around? <laughs> begrudgingly, it's not his elbow that I have to <laughs> grab. No, that's also, guys, I feel like I need to clarify these are jokes, so <laughs> please do not call the authorities. But yeah, well, you're, Ben you're, is my go-to guy, I'd say. You're, you're of age. You're okay. Oh, well, I guess you can make, You can make your own mind up. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> you can cut that out. I would recommend you cut that out. <laughs> I will. But yeah, Ben's my go-to guy. He's the boss, man. Do you find yourself grabbing by elbows? Absolutely not. No, no, no absolutely not. not. So it's usually a pat on the head, maybe a rub on the leg. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very physical relationship we have. That's why I work at home from now on. <laughs> Make a wish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish you hadn't made me make a wish. Uh, <laughs> that's a good point there. It's almost a, an unconscious decision. But remember, she's been sort of apprehensive ever since they found this spinning mm -hmm. uh, secret passage and then came across the rat. And they've been getting deeper and deeper, the skulls. I mean, this is a creepy place that they've been, <laughs> you know, slowly, you know, in this Dungeons and Dragons type dungeon. They've been getting further and further toward whatever the goal is of this particular quest. And they have found the lab. Remember, we're still searching for the source of the violin music that brought them here. That's right. And one other thing that I found interesting about this room, as they came down the hallway, you know, everywhere they've gone, there have been candles lit along the way. There was not a light on in here until they threw that switch. And then you don't see any torches or any lights on here. And um, so this really was kind of abandoned for years. Nobody's been working in there, certainly. It also appears to be the only place in the castle with any kind of functioning electricity. Still a lot. Yeah. It still works, mm -hmm. but uh, wired for electricity, we see the once it's turned on and we're panning around the lab, we've got overhead lights, We've and that's where a lot of this ambient light is coming from. As you said, no candles or torches, but we do have light fixtures throughout. Now, I, and as we're... It, and you only get this, I think, on repeated viewings because I don't remember the first time I noticed but as we're going through the slow pan and we're hearing the voice, the doorway toward the very back of the room at the bottom away from the stairs, you can see a definite light coming from behind the door. Yeah, I caught that when I was preparing for this minute. And I actually went past it and then went, wait a minute, there was light coming from that door and went back. And uh, that is an interesting lead. And, of course, we'll get to that in the following minutes, but it, it's a nice – it's those little small details that this goes beyond your typical – like we would have today, your typical slapstick, silly humor film. It's just going to go for the easy laugh, the body humor, the, the the fart jokes, and there's nothing wrong with those. I mean, Blazing Saddles, let's face it, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's sure. awesome. This movie does have those, but this movie also has such depth and texture and sophistication to go along with it. So it's really hitting laughter on all cylinders, not just a couple. Yeah, and, and this is a um, this is really a different kind of movie, both for Gene and even more so for Mel through the rest of their careers. I would be hard pressed to think of another movie that has this kind of detail and and texture to it that they they have in this one. Yeah, I, I think it's even more than you know. Blazing Saddles is a very good western, mm -hmm. and they've got that western feel, but. This, to me, the the artistry from the set design, art direction, costume, wardrobe, lighting, it all plays very well. As Again, this could be a monster movie that, that's meant to scare us the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so as we continue to look through, I, I do want to make a comment about set dressing here. The web work, the, the cobwebs, the spider webs, the dust is fantastic. 
you know, if it was done as a comedy today, it'd be either way over the top or they wouldn't have, I don't think, this kind of attention to detail. As this camera's panning, I forget at this moment, like if I just showed my kids just this moment, they would think we were watching a creepy movie. Yeah, oh, I, I think so. And, and I think that if you stood them side by side, it'd be kind of hard to tell which one was the 1931 and which one is Young Frankenstein. Just that's, because of yeah, that that's detail. exactly what happened to me when you showed me those screenshots. Yeah. I was like, wow, is this really the original? Because it looks just like yeah. Frankenstein. All right, so I just discovered something as we continue to loop through this minute as we do here in studio, just to kind of keep it up, make sure that we're not missing anything. There's the three candelabra set that, remember, was originally lit on the big table that Frau Bluka used to go up the stairs before it right. no longer was lit. Now take a look. And it, to me, it looks like it's lit. Let's go back a little bit. I, if we go, I'm going to show you. Right when we get to about second 47, right there on the table, far bottom left corner of the screen, we've got the three-tiered candelabra, and the candles are lit. That is crazy. I love when I can pick up a detail. I've yeah, seen this movie dozens oh. of times straight start to finish, and of course, getting prepared for today. Yeah. And how I missed that even looking at the notes for today, there's, there's a nice tell. We know who now it was down here. And that's the candelabra that earlier on was not lit. Well, it was lit, she, then not lit, yeah, now it's lit, lit again. Right. <laughs> was not supposed to be lit, and now it is lit. Huh, that's interesting. But if you're not paying attention, and you know, now we're, we're giving away the – because we the, our characters never figure it out until later. Mm -hmm. But there is a candelabra sitting there, and it is lit down there on the work table. So as we uh, wrap up this minute, there's again, this is a shorter type of minute. Gene Wilder, as you said, his character, when we finish the minute, makes the comment of, what a filthy mess. <laughs> it's almost like after the awe of, so this is where it all happened. But this is a nasty place, and this yeah, is ridiculous. This is and it's almost like he's dis trying to figure a way to dismiss it. Yes. Yeah, it's almost like he's snapping his fingers and being like, all right, back to the comedy movie that we've been doing this whole time. <laughs> yeah, not just the comedy, but to the, the dismissal of my past. Look at, oh, <laughs> this place. If he was any good self-respecting scientist, doctor, surgeon would never let yeah. this happen. Yeah, this could never work. you know. And he does kind of write it off and ready to move on. Well, as we close out minute here, number 31, Matt, anything you want to add? Anything we didn't cover in this particular? Uh, nothing we didn't cover, but yeah. I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find attention to detail like that in nowadays movies. I mean, every time you watch a movie that's made nowadays, you can point out the places where they're like, oh, wow, that chessboard had chess pieces in this scene, but in this scene it doesn't. How could they forget that? But they, they went to the, the trouble of making sure that they had, you know, the three candles that were in the scenes before, mm -hmm. make sure that they were down there, so. Props to him, I guess. C kind of a nice little tell for people who are really observant. Yeah. Ben, what about you? Anything we forgot to add? Anything you were thinking about on your way over? No, I just, I really love that they use the same set pieces from the 31 Frankenstein. I think that's remarkable and, and something that we, we didn't know. And now that you know, it just adds a little bit of element to, to the joy of the movie. I, I think yeah. for me, when I, when I know that, I can't wait later as these pieces of equipment are going to be put into use. Yeah, I think that's one of my favorite things to know about this movie. So uh, that's just a, a real, uh, and being kind of a history nut, that, that's a, a really cool homage to the original. Well, I think that's going to do it then for Minute 31. You guys, you guys available to swing on back by tomorrow after all of your uh, private dicking? You can come on back here. and <sighs> Only if that when we come back, you play The Boys Are Back in Town. <laughs> that's a special request that special I have. Request. I'm, I, I'll see what I can do. We yes. might, I might know somebody who knows somebody who can pay somebody off. That's, you're just talking about yourself. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Uh, well, we, then you, everybody come on back tomorrow because we definitely want to find out after this filthy mess, Igor... Igor has a comment about that, and we still have to figure out where that music is coming from. But Walt, before we say goodbye today to our fine audience, people who want to learn a little bit more about our podcast and who's been on our show and, I don't know, anything else about us, where can they go? They can go to www.thewilderride.com, and that has links to everywhere else you can find us, Facebook, uh, Patreon, all the other great places. And if you know who did the voice of Igor in the lab, I would love for you to comment either on Facebook or Patreon and let us know. Uh, and we'll come back and, um, and touch base with our audience about that uh, as a little reminder, because that I don't think is anywhere out there. I can't I can't find that. So somebody smarter than me, I, I challenge you to do that. Put it up on Facebook. Not hard to find. Yeah, it's not going to be hard to find that person. <laughs> so, uh, But that's that's the best place to find us, www.thewilderride.com. And don't forget, we do have two actual Facebook pages. The, there's the general page where we put some nice information out there for people to stumble across. But if you really feel compelled to get involved and share stories about Gene Wilder, his movies, or any other thing movie-related, We've got a listeners group. Come on by. It's the 
listeners group for The Wilder Ride, and we enjoy having all of the folks in there with their discussions and insights from when they were growing up watching Gene Wilder movies. Yes, and uh, also I want to say thank you to all the people who have commented. Thank you to the folks who've joined us on Patreon. We really have a great group of folks who are uh, coming together and working with us, and we do really appreciate each one of you. We try to respond, but with as many comments as we're getting, it is a little bit tough, but we thank you for uh, coming along for this ride with us. All right, until tomorrow then. Frankenstein. That's what she said wrong the first time. Oh, uh, Frankenstein? Frankenstein. 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 <laughs>